Hello and welcome to the Buy Intent podcast with me, Rocky Natha. Our guest today is the wonderful and beautiful Eleni Michael coming to us all the way from Cyprus. Eleni is a food anthropologist who is deeply involved in so many incredible ventures and organizations focused on sustainability in food systems. Eleni comes from a hospitality management background within leading five-star hotels, but her passions and her career shifted towards farm to table and zero waste restaurants. Now, most recently she has joined the Future Food Institute and the Food and Agricultural Organization, FAO of the United Nations on a regenerative food systems program as a food and climate shaper. Now, Lenny's going to talk to us about all of this. She's going to explain it. I know right now it sounds like what to all of us. So she's going to talk us through all of that. Um, but just to share a little bit about her amazing resume. She's also a member of the Charles Michel Conscious Eating Education Community. And she's recently hosted the Unconference on Sustainability and Privilege under that banner. Eleni is also currently studying her master's degree in anthropology at SOAS University of London, looking at the centrality of gastronomy um, in regenerating the present for a more sustainable future. So Eleni, a very, very warm welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you, Rocky. I'm so pleased to be here. Thank you for the invite. Our, our pleasure. We have so many questions <laughs> and we have so much to learn from you today. So I think the um, first question that comes up for me, right, is in the simplest sense, um, how would you explain to me, to the average person, right, what's really going on with our global food systems and, you know, what we need to understand about sustainability when it comes to food? And I think if you can touch on um, kind of the concept or the idea of circular practices, that would be great. Mm -hmm. Sure. Um, I'm sure, you know, it's a very big topic to tackle into a few sentences, but I could just say that the world's biodiversity is suffering. Uh, we have biomass dilution for increasing productivity of the land and crops worldwide to feed our populations, but also animals in an excessive way that should not be needed. So we, we increased and we shifted demand towards a direction that the humankind was not made for. Um, and uh, we're just constantly absorbing and extracting resources from the earth to a scale that uh, the land can't take it anymore. And um, in terms of circularity, um, I think if, you're, if you mean how we could tackle the problem, that is circular systems and looking at combining science intelligence, but science of all disciplines, not just looking at natural science, but also hum, um, human sciences, social sciences, people from all disciplines, as well as people who don't have a scientific agency, but they have their own personalities to bring in with their own um, cultural interests, interests of their own communities at an individual on a collective level and also uh, how to combine other disciplines like design and design thinking in tackling these big issues and addressing the problem on a small but also big scale, if that answered your question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I, I really appreciate that. I mean, I've been hearing the terminology, so it's really good to understand what that means. Um, and also realizing, gosh, it you know, it's really going to take the village <laughs> to to sort this this issue out, right? Um, and what I'm hearing from the heart of how you answered that was um, we, we created a really unsustainable way of producing what we need and what we consume. And it's kind of going back to saying, what, what do we need and how do we create that in a way that doesn't destroy our very environment or, or even us as people? Um, would that be fair to say, Yes, exactly. Exactly. You, you put it out very, very well. Okay, perfect. And I think with, with that, right, and with the topic of sustainability, um, there's a lot of myths and misconceptions. It's why we're speaking about it today. Um, for the average person, people still don't understand um, 
what's really happening with the environment or with food systems. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions. And like one of them I think about often is things like shifting to almond milk. You know, everybody just swooped over and was like, oh, almond milk, and that's going to solve the problem. <laughs> but, you know, while we know that almond milk has the lowest greenhouse gas emissions, on the other hand, it requires, at least from plant-based milks, you know, the most water. Um, it's a lot of pesticides. It's impacting the ecosystem of bees. Um, so similar to that, what are some of like the real myths and misconceptions that society has when it comes to sustainability? Yes, thank you for bringing that up as an example, perfect example um, of thinking of alternatives. And we all think that shift into a completely plant-based diet will save the planet when you're producing equally big externalities to other ecosystems. So another big example is avocado and you know the avocado trend all yeah. over the place um, and how it emerged of different diets that uh, claimed the neutrality, neutralizing our blood with the alkalines of avocado and you know the beauty of it and the flavor of it. But avocado is surely uh, amazingly produced and consumed in Latin America and some other countries where this, the climate supports it. Um, and it should really stay with us, those people who cultivate it. Because the moment we put it on a sheep and we uh, ship it out and it has a journey of you know months and it stays in fridges and we end up indulging in this Southern or let's say the most, the most modern and privileged world, we're essentially consuming the other people who are suffering for its production, distribution, and so on. So that is one example, but there's countless. Another one, for example, is the, the misconception of the health benefits of salmon. Um, salmon is surely well consumed in a climate that supports it and that produces it naturally in the wild sea and so on. But once we try and extend the production of salmon in such a scale that we need to farm it. We have lots of issues such as, you know, farms uh, accidentally breaking the nets and you have crossbreeding of the salmon. So you are essentially consuming a crossbreeded salmon that you thought it was wild. Um, and also it might not essentially be that healthy for you if you was fed in a farm. So it's such a, such a big topic with so many loose ends that the best way to tackle it is to look at what is available to you where you are because probably your genome and your body is also built better for that particular kind of food and uh, because you, you've touched upon the topic of milk substitutes there are populations that cannot digest milk well which has been proved through research that it has to do with your vitamin D absorption. So countries that are more exposed to the sun have more difficulty digesting milk, but that may not, may not apply to countries that are very um, you know, dark and don't have as much sunlight. So they can indulge on animal milk. Why not if they produce it in a sustainable way for the environment and for the animal welfare? So that's that's amazing. I mean, yeah, I, I had no idea, right? Um, regards to this link. Um, we know a little bit about avocados and um and that's the thing. I think there's so much to discover, to learn, to really just unpack about all these things. And and again, what I'm hearing and what I'm summating from this is eat local, eat seasonal, <laughs> um, keep it simple. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And I think the other the other question that comes up for people um, as they're trying to make these, because the truth is, um, I, I find a lot of more and more people uh, coming to the party in the sense of, oh, boy, we have a problem and, you know, I'm, I'm ready and I'm willing to play my part because I want a future for my kids. Um, I think people are starting to finally wake up to that reality of we really have a crisis. Um, and that's a good thing. That's a good thing. But I think the thing that comes up for a lot of people is 
how do you how do you balance nurturing and taking care of the environment versus taking care of the self? Um, I mean, it was interesting you shared about the salmon um, example. I mean, I didn't know that either. My my husband eats a lot of salmon, and now I'm like, okay, we gotta go back <laughs> to the table and um, think about that and understand where you know where the salmon's coming from and um, that sort of thing. But you know, protein is a is a big concept now because everybody's shifting to plant based protein. So where where do we find the balance? And I I know this is also a big question, but how do we balance? Take care, taking care of ourselves versus taking care of the environment. That is uh, perhaps the biggest issue I've been struggling with personally as well. Um, as I've cut down certain proteins from my diet for the past five years, and then I went through a period when I was on a completely vegan diet as well. But now I like to perhaps call myself like a selective omnivore because I um, I choose to consume certain proteins that I feel are good for me and the environment at the same time. So when it comes to fish, for example, which is something I consume now being in Cyprus, um, an island with, well, abundant fish uh, at, at this moment for our population. I consume fish once a week from local uh, fishmen, um, but that's all about it. I don't consume any frozen fish. And it's so difficult when it comes to gatherings as well and commensality. Um, so we need to find a way to be able to communicate our preferences without offending anyone, without imposing anything. Uh, but if you get asked, you first ask yourself, do you really want to eat that? Not just to indulge, but also how is it going to affect your you know, digestion and your body um, if you consume something that's comes out of a box and is highly processed. Um, and also looking at eggs or even for people who eat meat, do you, what type of meat do you go for? And we need to be really careful with transparency on labeling and all of these um, details because often you get the so-called grass-fed meat, grass-fed beef, which is only grass-finished. So you might have spent an entire life in a farm, in a cage, being fed on corn and other grains, but then it needs a certain period of time to pass on pasture so it can get the certification and be sold to you. And the same goes with, you know, free range eggs and all of these uh, labels we get on food. Amazing. I'm literally like <laughs> mind blown. Lenny, that's amazing. I think you, I mean, I didn't know that about salmon you know we know some of the things um or this concept of grass finished um again highlighting how little most of us or the average person knows um so yeah i think amazing um to understand that yeah a lot needs to be done in terms of food labeling and and the transparency of knowing you know what it is that we consume now i know just kind of outside of um what we've discussed um we haven't yet shared with everybody your incredible journey and you know we're going to be talking about that as we go through the interview but you are currently studying food anthropology and i think that is such an interesting subject what what does it entail what are you learning tell us all about it we, we basically think and interpret everything that goes behind all of the conversations we, we've just had together. So looking at production, not just in terms of the practicalities of production, but looking at who are the farmers, who are the handlers of food, who are the consumers of food. Does food have to do with class division? Does it have to do with gender and race, um, who consumes the other, uh, who is privileged and who is not. Um, looking at concepts of like food taboos and why are particular foods associated with um, disgust perhaps, and other foods associated with uh, indulgence and uh, Instagrammable foods and why are some things better to the eye than others and what are the pre-existing factors that might change your perception around certain things. What is your cultural identity? What did you grow up with? What, what did you listen um, to while you're growing up that has shifted your perception around food and your 
readiness to consume something or not. Um, such a, you know, deep uh, discipline with so many meanings that very difficult to, you know, tackle in five minutes, but also, you know, looking at how we re-socialize communities, we relocalize indigenous seeds and crops, but also, uh, you know, decolonize cultures because essentially a lot of food, big, some of the biggest food commodities in the world emerged out of uh, colonialism and slave trade and how do we inform people around that and how we inform ourselves and how do we shift food systems and the circular systems that we were talking about earlier so we can have a more equal uh, distribution of food worldwide. Yeah, I, I love that. It's kind of prompting my next question, but before I even go there, um, it reminded me of a company that I know, I think they're based out of California. Um, it's an Indian girl and um, I think they call diaspora.co. And it's what they're doing with regards to spices um, and respecting the heritage and the, the purity of the trade and kind of changing that language and educating people um, regards to um, spices, <laughs> where they come from and the, the, the hands they come from. And it's a very, very empowering brand. I think you'll like it. I think it's called diaspora.co. I've been thinking of trying out their product for a while. So I will send you that link. So you kind of prompted me about that. But um, you brought up, you know, another question that I had, which is, what is the um, relationship between food, sustainability and privilege? And I know that you were part of the conference with um, Charles Michel's community. So yeah, tell us, tell us a little bit about that. Unpack that for us. Sure. So um, I joined the Charles Michel Conjusinti community in September earlier last year. And together we uh, organized a conference on this topic you've just mentioned. So looking at how do we achieve this sustainable system and access to these you know, selective uh, food sources that we've been talking about if we don't have the same level of access as someone else. So how do we get the underprivileged population to be able to have choice? Um, but also how do you allow and how do you educate the privileged population to be more informed uh, in their decisions so they can then allow a more equitable system that can feed the underprivileged populations um, as much as I can frame it in two sentences. The concept of equity even in, in food um, mm. and, and that there is a need to address that and need to address privilege in food. And I mean, you see it become issues at times like we saw what COVID did and the people who didn't have access to exactly the kinds of foods we need at a time like this. Exactly. I specifically hosted a room on the concept of regenerative agriculture when it meets gastronomy and what happens there. Um, so looking at, you know, old cuisine and fine dining and how can they be agents for a better system? Because often people will think, oh, you know, those type of restaurants are only for a small niche of the population. But essentially, those type of restaurants set trends that are then replicated by food uh, fast food chains that are consumed by everyone. Um, so looking at the impact on COVID on some of these farm to table restaurants, how did they use, how did they leverage their privilege to support communities? And then you, sh you see different restaurants who adopted, you know, the farm to box um, model where they would deliver farmers produce on people's homes. So they're still supporting local farmers, how they've taken this time to still educate their teams and encourage not just cooks, but also, you know, front of house people, people of all uh, divisions of a food service operation to grow edible gardens in different parts of the world. Um, and also looking at, you know, zero waste systems and what does that mean? How do you apply that to an operation and where do you start from? How small changes can make a big difference? Um, yes, so in a few words. And I love that. No, that's so, so interesting because 
uh, we do kind of separate, <laughs> um, you know, sort of um, gourmet kind of cuisine away from this. And that's such an interesting link and something to think about. And it, um, it reminds me of the work that Jose Andres is doing in the US, right? And he's played such an important role during COVID. Um, and I saw a lot of people step up to the plate, right? Uh, Roy Choi and, you know, a lot of people kind of doing interesting things to, to, to keep people fed um, during a time when it just kind of hit us all. So that's that's really interesting to think about that, that link. Because, um, yeah, it's also something we just kind of take for granted um, and push aside, but I, I really like that link. Um, now, kind of shifting to, I, we could talk about all of this for hours, right? And that's the challenge. But um, kind of shifting, I want to shift a little bit towards your personal story and, you know, your journey, right? Um, and a little bit of how you develop such an interesting career and working in such um, interesting areas in your life, right? Um, now, we've spoken a bit before, and I know a little bit of your story. I know that, you know, your parents are refugees. And, you know, that's a big part of your story, right? And um, has both impacted, you know, identity, um, history, but how has your history, your journey, your experiences impacted um, your career and, 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 and the concept of purpose in your life? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, okay, where shall I start from? Perhaps from the beginning, how I got into food, etc. So when I was in high school, I, I enjoyed a lot of different subjects you know I was really into art and music for my whole childhood but I was also really uh, in love with mathematics and physics and and languages actually um, so when it came to choosing a university degree I really didn't know what to do and I figured that um, I love you know socializing I love um, interacting with people and then I came across you know hospitality and tourism as a discipline and I thought it would fit my personality so I'll go for it and see where it takes me um, and um, when I first my first job was in a luxury five-star hotel uh, of London the Savoy so worldwide reputable hotel and that was my full-time internship um, that I took out of university for a year um, where I had some really you know intense uh, moments experiences serving important people getting working really hard that I was um, 20 at the time I was doing you know 60 hours a week I was going home at five in the morning but I think what just never let me give up was knowing, as you said, asking about my parents, how hard they work to achieve what uh, they're doing and how they thrive through, you know, post-war period and how, they, how hard they have worked to go through things. Um, I just thought I need to do this. Um, and I had an increasing passion from different people I was interacting with, getting inspiration from, you know, other chefs or uh, some of my guests even who were really enjoying the experiences we we're crafting for them and that was giving me a lot of motivation to continue and also uh, my exchange study abroad in Hong Kong actually was very instrumental to my understanding of gastronomy because that was, that's when I did my first classes in gastronomy and olfactory studies and and wine and I was 19 at the time so that was all very new to me and it was my first time you know going from a country of under 1 million population to one of the dense then more densely populated cities in the world so I was I went there alone and I had to get on with it <laughs> and I really made the most of it and that's what sparked my passion for gastronomy and digging deeper because I had a project at the time to write about my food culture and I wrote about, you know, Cypriot food and cuisine. So then uh, coming back to the UK and continuing to work uh, during my studies in different part-time jobs, you know, very luxury catering services, hotels, restaurants, um, and then did various, uh, you know, a graduate program with a group of hotels, experiencing all divisions of that operation. Um, again, very inspired by people who were 
really uh, achieving well in their jobs, but also what they're creating and how creative you can be in the hospitality industry. But then um, when I started working in a Michelin star restaurant, building on from my experience in luxury hotels, I just felt like, why are we in this bubble where we serve amazing food, amazing experiences for thousands of pounds per table? Um, when people don't know where the food's coming from, when people are suffering from hunger and poverty in producing those foods that the others are consuming. And that was really, you know, reflecting back on my upbringing, listening to the stories of war in Cyprus and how our grandparents struggled through uh, poverty and food aid and everything that comes with war, unfortunately. And uh, that's when I sort of started awakening this um, need inside me to answer different questions when it comes to the food system. Um, and I went to work for some farm to table restaurants. I was then hired to open a zero waste restaurant which was the most meaningful step in my career uh, so far. And then um, I wanted to really dig deeper and that's what brought me to food anthropology as a study, which I'm pursuing now. Yeah, you have such a beautiful story and um, such a, yeah, such an organic um, but authentic journey in discovering all of that for yourself as well. You know, because you could have had so many different careers in this world and gone down a very different path. And I think you've chosen um, such an interesting way to, to craft your future. So I'm very excited about everything you're going to do and, you know, where you're going. And um, some of the interesting things that you are doing right now, right, is that you're working with the um, Future Food Institute and with um, FAO as well. Tell us a little about your involvement with all of that. Sure. So the Future Food Institute is in collaboration with FAO delivering a regenerative food systems program uh, every few months uh, that is normally uh, held in person. But because of COVID, it was done online when I did it last summer. So there's different tracks when it comes to regenerative uh, kitchens, uh, climate smart oceans, climate smart farms, and also cities. So according to the track you choose, you go really deep into that domain, but also always considering all factors. And uh, what I love about Future Food Institute is their design thinking in everything they do. So this systems approach, the circular system we spoke about earlier, um, this uh, sense of we, we should all be equal and we should all fight towards the same uh, goals for equal distribution of um, access to food as discussed. And uh, I was a certified food and climate shaper. So I'm proudly um, an ambassador of the Institute. And I'm also perhaps helping with um, the, the future candidates who want to become food and climate shapers, guiding them through the journey. I will also be hosting a global discovery in the bootcamp that is coming up. I'll be showcasing um, a colleague's um, non-profit organization in California actually <laughs> uh, next month who is working on uh, farm workers rights um, so really helping to build this network and help uh, connect dots where possible from my side and uh, also representing Cyprus as I'm I think the only one who's associated with the institute from Cyprus so, so exciting and such cool work. And, you know, it gives me a lot of hope um, to know this kind of stuff is happening. So um, knowing somebody like you is out there, along with a lot of other amazing people, and you guys are working on this for all of us. <laughs> it benefits all of us. It, it really gives me a, a lot of hope. So, so exciting. I'm going to keep watching the space and everything you're doing there. And, you know, it's a pity everything is virtual. It would have been amazing if you were in California, because we would definitely, you know, have met you then. But, um, you know, hopefully in the future. But what I would say there is that the amazing thing about all this being online is that in this one month that I, I took the bootcamp myself, we would start from a session in Africa in the morning, then go to Indonesia and then go to 
the US and then go to Iceland and we would have never been able to gather all these change makers together in one space if it was um, in person. So maybe that's just another side of COVID. Yeah, totally, totally a great, great way to look at it. We're just super excited to see everything you're going to do in the future. And, you know, we'll keep watching that space and for everybody that's the Future Food Institute. But, you know, I'll be linking all of Eleni's details as well. So you can follow her and just follow her journey. She's doing such cool work out there. So I think you, you're you going to find it to be pretty amazing. Um, the kind of, you know, as, we, as we're wrapping up and getting closer to wrapping up our interview, um, as a last, and this is a big question again, I know they all are, but as a last summative question, right? If you had to <laughs> bring it down to um, saying that these are the top three issues we face right now in sustainability, and I know that's really tough, but if we could, what would you say those three are? And what you know, what can we, again, as the average person, um, what are the things we should, those three things we should be doing right now, um, immediately that we can do tomorrow to play our role um, in all of this? So I will narrow it down to food sustainability specifically, otherwise it's way too big. I would say, first of all, is food waste. And this is not only related to households and the waste that goes on at home, but it also traces back to the production of food at the very first stage when it comes to, you know, cross continent shipping and also a lot of government and state power over farmers where a lot of the produce is surplus and then goes to waste. But what we could do for food waste at home um, is really shop as little as we can when we really need something. And there's also a lot of beautiful ancestral wisdom around fermenting foods that we can implement at home so we can make sure we have foods uh, at season uh, when they're when they're best at season and also you know we prevent them from just ending up in the bin if you know you're not going to eat something but it's already in your cupboard you can ferment it uh, or freeze it or preserve it in some way there's so many ways you can turn a different fruits or vegetables into condiments. Um, the second biggest problem I would say is ignorance um, that comes with education, which again might be a privilege at a lot of times, uh, but the best way to do is, is really be curious about everything you're buying, question every label you're reading, just Google it. What is, what is grass fed? What is uh, free range? And what is an additional um, certification that I can find that can assure me extra protection of that product for the sake of the animal, the, the environment, but also my health. And the third problem I would say is marine biodiversity really going into extinction, looking at thousands of varieties of seaweed and uh, plankton and other substances that we don't think about that go into extinction because of plastic and because of overfishing and all these um, all these detrimental practices we have so really be conscious in everything you buy whether it is a clothing item whether it is uh, something for the house something you will eat um, anything really thank you thank you Eleni I think um, you know, that message is, is clear is we, we need to stop and think <laughs> um, about our consumption habits um, and, and really start changing those as people. And um, yeah, certainly is, is something, you know, in my in my home, we are starting to commit to deeper and deeper. So I hope that we kind of all take on that challenge because we need to, we have to. Um, but kind of wrapping us up some fun questions or shorter questions at least. Um, so uh, the next three questions really relating to the three buy intent areas of identity, purpose and experience. Um, I've got three questions for you, but I'm really looking for short answers. So it can be a word, it can be a few words, maximum two or three very short sentences. <laughs> That's the absolute max. <laughs> um, so um, the first one is, you know, how has your identity impacted uh, your relationship to food? Word, memory. <laughs> nice. Okay. Care, care mm -hmm. for the produce. 
Awesome. Okay, great. And then the next one is, what is the purpose of food in your life? Change. Mm, I think food can be a great platform to have conversations of other things as well. So I was recently, you know, studying about uh, gastronomic tourism, food tourism, and often by taking tourists around different sides of the city to take them to a specific restaurant, you can stop by and tell them about a historical event that happened there and discuss even, you know, politics and uh, power relations problems. So food is a medium for change in a lot of different domains. That's beautiful. And then the, the last one then there is, how are you crafting an ideal experience of your life through food? Um, I would say purpose. So everything I do, every step I take has a purpose. And I don't take any career steps or any you know, physical movement steps when it comes to living in different places, different cities, unless it serves my purpose of achieving a change in the food system and also a better society for the world. And uh, then the last, last one is the fun one. It's our quick fire round. So again, it's just, you know, probably one word answers and go as quick as you can. Okay. So um, <laughs> are you ready? <laughs> Not sure. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, the first question is your favorite restaurant. So I would say Treadwells uh, in my local neighborhood in London up until a year ago, because it is super seasonal and super balanced in the menu in terms of protein, plants, and also very nutritious food. Your favorite um, recycling or waste reduction hack. Freezing the bread that you're not going to eat for the whole week. Awesome. Your favorite foodie city? Tokyo. Very nice. The best dish you make? I make pasta with tomato and miso. Ooh, very nice. That sounds delicious. Eleni, thank you so, so much. This was so interesting. I have learned so much um yeah there's just so much to unpack and it just kind of highlights to myself and hopefully to all the listeners that there's a lot for us to learn here you know and I think like you said we need to be a lot more conscious and curious about learning and making better choices and changing our food habits so we can solve some of the the issues that we are facing um you know as, as a united world so Eleni thank you so much for the work you're doing it's so interesting we're going to follow your work um as we wrap up now is there any Anything else you'd like to share with our listeners? Thank you, Raki. Um, I would just say, just be curious, question everything. Don't take anything for granted. And also try and share knowledge once you find out something new. Just share it with your friend circle. Or if you have children, really try and make them aware and conscious as early as possible. Thank you. I think beautiful summation to today. Eleni, thank you so, so much for your time. For everybody who is listening or watching, like, subscribe. Eleni's details will be in the description. Uh, so be sure to follow her as well. Eleni, thank you so much for being here. And till next time, I will catch everybody then. Thank you so much and bye for now.